Emily Laidlaw with us for her presentation on online shaming technology and privacy and I think the number of, of people that we've had sign up for this um, attest to the fact that these are areas of great interest to our students they're emerging areas of law it's exciting things that you sometimes just don't get the chance to delve into in your first year because you've got all your required courses so this is just meant to give you a little taste of some of the things that you might um, want to take courses in um, after first year um, but I'd like to start just by um, uh, not just welcoming you, but I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy um, and the Stony Nakoda, Bears Paw and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is home to the Métis Na Nation of Alberta, region number three. And I would like to acknowledge that the University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River and that the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call Calgary. Um, two updates before we get started. I wanted to let you know that we will be in a position to update all our admitted students on how classes will be taught in the fall for 1Ls early next week. So look for a letter from Dean Holloway. And I also wanted to give you the good news that we've learned that our graduating class has a 100% um, articling placement rate, which is utterly fantastic. So we're very proud of that. And I wanted to share that news with you. Um, as you know, we will be doing an online session in June with our career and professional development office. So any questions you have relating to that sort of um, thing to actual jobs when school is over with, um, if you save those up for our CPDO office, um, they are very knowledgeable, an incredible group of people, and, um, and they'd be happy to help you. So with that, I'm just gonna give a very brief introduction of, of Professor Laidlaw. So in addition to teaching Foundations One, and some of you would have joined us potentially for one of our online sessions already that Emily's um, spoken to you about, about Foundations. And I know that she and Jennifer Koshan will also be updating you over the course of the summer. And they've been working really hard on, on Foundations. Um, Emily also teaches courses pertaining to internet law, law and privacy and cybersecurity law. And she researches in the area of cybersecurity, information technology, intellectual property, media law, human rights, and corporate responsibility. So with that, I would just like to welcome Emily, and we look forward to your mini lecture. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can everyone hear me? Catherine, can you hear well? Can you give me a thumbs up? It's good? a little low. I, I think it could be a little louder. Yeah. yeah. But that could be my ears because I'm old. I have the volume turned up. Um, oh, I got a thumbs up from one of the students. So hopefully that works. I have all the volume up as high as it can go. Um, let me share the screen with you so you can see my nifty slides here. And we will get going. I, I'm really excited to get a chance to talk to you all about um, this little area of the law and also because I get to teach you as your foundations prof in September so I think it's really fun to kind of get a chance to connect with you a little bit now about um, about this particular topic so what I'm going to look at today and um, maybe what we can do is answer some questions more at the end I think that that will probably work best but add them into the chat and then I can look at them then I'm going to look at do we have a right to privacy in the digital age so you know really what kinds of privacy invasions are unlawful and I'm going to look at a particular area here which is technology facilitated forms of online abuse and really just teach you at a broad level what the laws are in the space that regulate it. So I'm going to look at some of the key laws in um, key civil and criminal laws. And by civil, I'm referring to uh, private causes of action. I'm going to be looking at tort law, which is really a private wrong. It's when I feel my privacy has been invaded and in a way that's unlawful and I decide to sue what I see to be the blameworthy party, whether it's another individual or a corporation. 
So let's first familiarize ourselves with, you know, what some of the forms of technology facilitated abuse are. And, and you know, uh, many of these terms probably are more familiar to you than me. Some of you, I think it was your generation that really coined many of these terms. So like doxing, where you reveal personal information about a person without their permission, swatting, where you call emergency services to their house, uh, catfishing, where they create, you know, fake online profiles to target someone, usually it's some form of romantic deception, all kinds of forms of, say, online impersonation, harassment, bullying, shaming. Um, uh, an example that comes to mind is where an individual's information might be posted on an escort or shaming site without their permission or information shared on social media like Instagram or Facebook or something, all for the purpose of humiliating the subject. Um, but there's kind of more that's going on, particularly when you get into tech facilitated forms of privacy invasion. And that's why I'm dwelling here a little bit. Uh, search engines end up amplifying sometimes the currency of information about a person because it just sort of lives forever. But also certain forms of tech now um, are causing new and unique forms of privacy invasion. So think of internet things, devices, and especially consumer ones, you know, your Apple Watch, your fitness trackers, thermostats, smart speakers, smart TVs, baby monitors, children's toys, you name it. They're all um, cheap and small and they're connected online and they're really enabling new forms of surveillance. Um, and they're also actually increasingly being used in, in, um, in forms of domestic abuse. And that's something we're gonna circ about, circle back to later. But some of the new tech would be, say, pen cameras that make certain forms of surveillance easy. And um, there was a recent Supreme Court of Canada case, and it was about a criminal charge. It was a voyeurism case. And it was where a high school teacher used a pen camera to take videos of student chest areas. And one of the, the, the I mean, it's just creepy, right? But one of the key issues in the case was, well, is there a reasonable expectation of privacy when you're in kind of a semi-public place, such as like the high school cafeteria, for example. And I think we all know instinctively this is a privacy invasion, but interestingly, it was a real struggle to get the law there. So in the area of domestic abuse, technology is being used in all kinds of ways, breaking in and monitoring accounts, installing spyware, uh, revenge pornography, and, and I use that term, it's, it's kind of a casual term, but we all know what it is. Uh, the, the proper terminology is non-consensual distribution of intimate images. Uh, there might be surveillance with hidden cameras, GPS tracking, um, they might target someone, you know, strangers might target someone even with malware to download and through that gain access to their cameras and microphones. And some of the perpetrators here don't just monitor, but they have the power to do things. So they might turn on and off lights. They might um, turn uh, the heat on in the house, change the locks. If it's connected to the internet, they can do many things. But the nature of the threat is evolving even further. So consider robots for a minute. You know, as, our, as robots sort of become more mainstream in our lives, they create numerous privacy vulnerabilities. And, and I love this phrasing of this, this scholar, Ari Waldman. He said, robots are designed to cue trust. You know, we have a social experience with them. We feel love and trust, and we willingly part our data, which can then be exploited by a third party who gets their hands on it. So the last two ones I'll mention would be deep fakes. I've been focusing on that a lot lately in my basement, hiding and doing some research. And deep fakes are, realistic audio, video, or images that have in fact been altered using machine learning. And so they're hyper-realistic and they are going mainstream. It used to be, you know, it took hundreds of pictures um, to be able to put it together. And that's why the targets were usually celebrities or politicians, but now um, there are apps that help you do it. You can use only one or two pictures. So deep fakes are used to makes someone look like they made a sex video that they didn't, makes them appear drunk, makes them appear like they're saying things like racial slurs. And so they're really effective at, you know, undermining democracy when they target a politician or where they're uh, primarily being used in a personal context is to target often women 
and the LGBTQ community, usually for reputational sabotage and humiliation. So this is a whole lot that I'm throwing at you, and we're not going to be able to solve it all today. But I did want to cast the net wide so you just see all the different ways that privacy and technology are intersecting. Um, we, I do go into depth in these issues, you know, as Catherine mentioned, I do have upper year courses that um, explore these topics, but let me give you right now then what happens with this tech and what is the law in a nutshell. So Emily, can I just interrupt really quick? Oh, we can't see your slides. What? You can, you well, just luckily see... I didn't put, we can't. I no, can't. we just see like your, we just see like your PowerPoint, like just the general like editing screen. It didn't oh. share. Can you see me chatting? Yes. Okay, let me start sharing again. <laughs> Sorry, uh, thank you. Ba, ba, ba. Share. I don't know why it paused. There we go, that's working now. Hmm. Um, well, you all missed out on the one pretty <laughs> slide where I listed all of these tech things, but apparently couldn't do the tech to be able to share it to you, so that was a bit of a fail. Um, but here, so if you can see in front of you, then the, uh, the criminal code provision. So these are what I'm going to look at here. Um, many of the activities I've mentioned are crimes under the criminal code. Um, they're not strictly speaking framed as, as pr from the privacy angle, but there's kind of a privacy theme running through them. So our criminal code is a federal statute. And that means that the law has been you know, we, we go over a lot of this when we talk about the legal system and foundations, but saying it's a federal statute means it's been codified in some written form, and then that is interpreted by judges, and that the law applies across Canada. So let's look at some of the key provisions here. So intimate images uh, is a crime to essentially distribute revenge pornography. It is a new provision that's existed since December 2014, and, and some of you might know the history of this, but the impetus of this really was just this horrific cyberbullying of Retea Parsons and Amanda Todd. Now, we've had five years since this has come into effect. I saw a recent report that the police have handled 5,000 complaints in the last five years under this provision, um, and there have been about charges in about 20% of the cases. Now, the other criminal code provision here is child pornography. This one, you know, was used sometimes to prosecute teenagers before the intimate images provision what came into effect. It still exists and can be used. Um, it essentially says it's illegal to make, distribute, possess, or access child pornography. And when teens distribute pictures of themselves, for example, photos of underage kids, this is in fact child pornography. Um, criminal harassment, this offense require, requires repetitive behavior. So that can sometimes be difficult to address some of the online behavior. So you have to have repetitive following or communicating or threatening conduct. And it's something that has to instill a fear in the target and that that fear has to be reasonable. So there have been successful convictions here um, particularly when it comes to harassment of politicians. I remember that there was a conviction um, when, for harassment of Michelle Rempel online back in 2015. Now, let's look at the hate speech provision. It is a crime to publicly incite or willfully promote hatred against a particular group. Um, interestingly here, it really is, you know, a, a criminal prosecution is really the only option if you want to address hate speech. I guess you could complain to a platform to have that content removed, and then we're getting into all the terms of service of Facebook and Twitter and so on. Um, but in Canada, you're really, you're legally, your only option then is really a, a prosecution because we used to have, you know, you couldn't go to a human rights commission. We used to have a provision there, but that was repealed. And there is no civil cause of action to sue for hate speech. You basically have to package it as something else like um, invasion of privacy or, or defamation. Identity fraud. Is it a crime to impersonate someone online? Yes, that, it is a crime. You could be charged with, and I love this, it's called fraudulently personating another to gain an advantage. 
Um, you could be charged with identity fraud if you use the identity for some other illegal purpose, like, you know, fraud or deceit. Voyeurism was, when I mentioned the case of that high school teacher in the pen camera, he was charged with voyeurism in that case because he was surreptitiously observing and recording these high school students in a situation where in the end the court found there was a reasonable expectation of privacy. So voyeurism has also been used to prosecute um, uh, situations of upskirting, you know, when surreptitious photos are taken up women's skirt. There was a case that some of you might have noticed a few years ago of someone called Calgary Creep who was wandering around Calgary doing that and had a Twitter account where he was posting the photos. The last few I want to take a look at would be extortion. So this would be inducing someone to do something under threat. So extortion has, um, has been, you know, we often see it in cases of, say, revenge pornography, where an ex threatens to share an intimate image uh, if, um, if their ex doesn't do something, for example. And sometimes it is to get them to pay them money, and sometimes it is to get them to engage in a particular sexual act, whatever it is, or to stay in a relationship, something. So it is a crime to hack a computer. So intercepting private communication sometimes can be the basis of the charge, fraudulently intercepting the functioning of a computer. So um, fraud has been used sometimes. So some of those phishing emails that you see would be fraud. One of the kind of catch all criminal provisions for hacking would be mischief. So mischief has been used to um, prosecute cases of denial of service attacks, or malware. So there's quite a broad array of laws I've introduced to you really quickly. And the real challenge here isn't necessarily whether we have the laws to cover what we need to cover. Um, the challenge in criminal law is really the, the capacity to investigate and prosecute these sorts of crimes. You know, if the defendant is a stranger and anonymous, then the ability to track them down, to identify them and prosecute them can be difficult. And also, of course, the willingness of the victim to proceed with criminal charges that, you know, they could decide to prosecute anyway, but it's more difficult if you don't have the willingness of the other parties involved. Let's take a look at the Canadian Charter then. Do we have a constitutional right to privacy? We do, and it's in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and in particular, it's really set out in Section 8. Everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. Is very familiar, um, perhaps, because it's quite similar to the American approach, so they root it also in search and seizure. The, there's a few things I want to tease out here. One is we only have this right directly against the state, so against the government. And the other is that because this is rooted in search and seizure, all the case law tends to involve criminal cases. And, and there are a wealth of them. In the last five years, I think that we're seeing two or three cases at the Supreme Court of Canada on something related to tech and privacy. They just keep rolling in. They've explored cases in the areas of you know, whether you have a right to privacy in home computers, then in what about shared home computers? Do we have a right to privacy in IP addresses? How about cell phones? Um, some of the more recent ones have looked at, okay, do you have a right to privacy in your text messages? Well, what about if it's not your phone? You know, what does a sender of a text have a right to privacy if the receiver of the text phone is actually searched? And the answer is yes. Social media messages, this was one of the most interesting cases. It, um, gosh, it's been almost a year, I think, since that decision was made by the Supreme Court. And it was fascinating because it was a really split decision by the Supreme Court. It was a case of Arn Mills um, on whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the messages you send. So here the police had posed as a 14-year-old on Facebook and the accused then tried to lure her, thinking that, you know, this was an underage girl. And so the court was really split, but the majority concluded that there is no right to privacy 
in a stranger conversing with a child. So they tried to take a narrower approach. So you or I guess notionally still have a right to privacy in the messages you send on social media, I guess, unless you're an adult conversing with a child. One of the more interesting opinions was of another judge of the court who was like, no, 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 we don't need to do this. The answer is yes, you have a right to privacy and the police should get a warrant. So let's then move to, uh, to private law. So this is shifting away from, you know, public law in a situation where there might be a decision to prosecute someone for a crime or an examination of whether there's been some sort of charter invasion related to that. Um, and the next question is, well, what if I want to sue somebody because they, for example, shared an intimate image of me without my consent? Historically in Canada, we did not have a right to privacy in a civil context. So it usually piggybacked other well-established torts. So we're thinking of trespass, nuisance, something like defamation, which is lies that impact reputation. Some provinces have passed legislation, so they actually have codified it in their Privacy Act. So you're thinking British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Newfoundland. You don't need to remember all of these provinces or all these laws here. I'm just kind of listing them for you. What's important to remember is, okay, some have codified a law, some provinces, others have not. And they have left it to the common law, which is judge-made law, which means that you try to sue, hope it kind of sticks and that the law incrementally is developed by judges. There are specific subject matters that have, um, that there have been, there are privacy legislation about. Uh, in particular, some provinces, including Alberta, have passed legislation to address revenge pornography. So Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. I'm actually working on a project right now with um, the Uniform Law Conference of Canada because we wanted to create uniformity in these civil you know revenge pornography laws and so we're drafting right now kind of a, a model law and and we've actually incorporated uh deep fakes that are sexual in nature as being treated like revenge pornography so what about more generally alberta can you sue for an invasion of privacy here uh the answer is maybe probably you might be able to sue but it's really unclear uh, we have no definitive case here. If we do have a right, it would likely draw from the case that is on the slides in front of you. It's, it's an Ontario Court of Appeal case, Jones and Siege. Um, it is really the landmark case in Canada of introducing a common law tort of privacy. And we'll, we'll talk in foundations about, you know, how do you know if a case is binding on another province? How do I treat a case like this in Alberta and, you know, vice versa? And, um, and what you can look at this case and just know now that it's because it's a high level court and it's an, you know, it's an Ontario Court of Appeal decision, it's influential here, but it is not binding. So let's think for a moment about these particular um, torts I have in front of you. Let's work our way through it. Okay, Jones introduced an intrusion on seclusion tort in Canada. What that means is you can sue if your seclusion or private affairs have been somehow intruded. That was just a really weird case where some bank employee, I think she didn't really trust that her partner was telling the truth about where his money was going. You know, he's saying, I'm paying all this child support and alimony to my ex. So she went and started checking the bank records of the ex, but not once or twice, like hundreds of times over a few years. And so the ex successfully sued her for intrusion on seclusion. So what you'll see here is that this is like a bundle of torts. This is four different torts. It is the American torts. So we imported it directly from the United States. And so it's four different causes of action. So Jones just introduced the one and it's since been used for some class action lawsuits. So you think the data breaches of Home Depot, um, Ashley Madison, none of the cases made it very far because they all settled 
but they all sued under this intrusion on seclusion tort. The second one is public disclosure of private embarrassing facts. So after Jones, there were then successful cases for revenge pornography using and introducing this kind of public disclosure tort. The third one is publicity in a false light that just kind of, you know, is basically painting you in a false light. It's not defamation. It's not untrue. It's just kind of making you look bad. We, this first case on it was just about a month ago. So it's a lower court in Ontario. So I don't really know what's going to happen with that particular tort. Um, but I think it's a really interesting one to introduce to Canada. And the fourth doesn't really matter for you right now. It's, it's been around for a few decades. It was appropriation of someone's name or likeness for commercial purposes. So essentially, if any of you are famous and someone decides to use your image in like a Gatorade ad with Michael Jordan, and I've been watching The Last Dance a lot lately. So let's say that happens to you, then you have rights in your image for commercial purposes. And this would be the tort you would use to sue. I want to end this though on a slightly different note because this was just a real flyby on some of the basics of the law. Um, you know, we looked at this developing body of law in a criminal law context and a charter context, and we saw that there's quite a bit there. But interestingly, despite what it might seem like, there is a real gaps in the area of private law and in, you know, in civil law and our ability to be able to sue somebody else for an invasion of privacy. Um, I, I've got a four year grant to do work on this particular issue and I've just been hiding working on it for the last several months. And so I wanted to just tell you a bit about, well, where is this all going? Um, and it's also too, because before you start law school, I really want you to start thinking critically about the law. Um, it will give you a leg up. It gives you a sense of the creativity and the advocacy involved in the law. So let's think of some of the examples I gave at the beginning of my talk. And, and I don't know if I'm going over time, by the way. So Ali and Catherine, maybe two minutes left. Um, so all the examples I gave really are just the beginning of tech enabled forms of abuse. So here's my short answer. And this is me just looking at this, this tort I just mentioned a minute ago. That four kind of torts I gave you, they're pragmatic and they're rule-based and they're neat and tidy. Uh, but once you start unpacking a bit, the casualties, there's a whole lot of, of privacy invasions I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that are not covered by this particular tort. So if you say, look at intrusion on seclusion, it's largely a binary analysis. You have a right to privacy in, in private places, but no real right to privacy in public. So when you think of that pen camera and high school teacher, so he might be charged with voyeurism, but you would not be able to succeed at suing him for a civil cause of action for invasion of privacy because it's just not, because they're in a semi-public place. So let's look at the second tort for a second, uh, public disclosure of private information. Well, it has to just be private information. So this doesn't really square with our sharing culture. There's all kinds of situations where we share trusting it's going to stay within that particular little nest, right? That the image that you posted on Facebook won't be copied and pasted, and I guess posted for, uh, pardon me, on a shame site or manipulated and zoomed in and kind of reposted somewhere. The whole tort's predicated on the idea that the second you share anything about yourself, it entirely defeats a privacy claim. You know, there'd be no claim for impersonation, for catfishing, any of that. You might be able to claim uh, for some, maybe some forms of consumer surveillance, you know, like all the platforms and data brokers that are tracking everything we do online. Um, you know, my son has decided he likes Unspeakable on YouTube, which just torments me. And he announced to me how he found his website and wants to buy merch. And then immediately on Facebook, all my ads were how I could go buy unspeakable merch. Um, so other forms of cyber stalking probably could succeed in an intrusion on seclusion tort. So last thoughts, none of these torts provide a roadmap for some of the bigger tech problems we're facing. Where artificial intelligence is being used, you know, what are the roles of those who are using the artificial intelligence? Because we're one step behind. What if the invasion is done by a robot? Who's responsible for algorithms? 
What about how harms amplified? What's the responsibility of search engines? Um, and there's no clear cause of action in invasion of privacy for deep fakes. And, you know, we might be proposing this particular law, but right now, not much in, invasion, in, in the privacy area. You know, there are other things that you could sue for, but I'm just kind of focusing on privacy right now. And, and even those don't quite cover the nugget of what we're concerned about here. So here's what I want to leave you with. Tech law, or I guess tech, is swiftly evolving. And as you can see from this brief rundown of the law, there are huge gaps in the law, particularly on the civil side. Um, but we are in early days in this space and it makes it a really fun area to work and also to study. Thank you so much, Emily. That was so interesting. <laughs> I wish I could go back to law school when I hear some of these things. Um, so um, please feel free to type in your questions. Um, we do have a couple coming up, and Allie, if you wouldn't mind moderating those, that would be fantastic. Um, one question I had just as I was talking was thinking about what sorts of privacy issues have come up specifically with COVID? Have there been interesting things going on with that? I mean, we're all getting a little sick of COVID, but... Um, I know, and you know, I... Uh... I actually chose to avoid that topic to scare everybody a bit of like COVID. Like, let's instead talk about you know, revenge pornography and like cyber stalking. Um, yeah. But um, I, uh, I'm actually part of a group. I, I posted a blog post. If anyone wants to to read it, I wrote a computer scientist professor and my colleague also in law, Greg Hagen. And so COVID tracking through the apps is is a huge area of concern right now and and partly because what is going to help us start trying to contain some of this it's data um but there becomes this data complacency they talk about it where we sort of sleep our way or walk uh, sleepwalk our way into a situation where you get used to this new surveillance right so it's about how do you monitor it another area of law and privacy is data protection which is our privacy commissioners and they look at data and so covid tracking like those those apps fall into that particular category which is these data protection laws um if we don't in kind of institute real oversight of how this works um we're not going to know at all what happens with our data who it's shared with what it's used with later on and if private companies have their hands on it well then they can repurpose it for many things yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. So we did have a question that came in. Um, someone wants to know what a constitutional right is. Yeah, I saw that one. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I usually have a really juicy and easy way to explain it in my foundation's notes. So now you're catching me to see if I can do it offhand. And so, I mean, essentially, we have a constitution in Canada, which is almost like the supreme law of Canada. And it just means that these laws are entrenched and they cannot be changed by just like a majority of parliament changing the laws. And so uh, when I say constitutional right, our charter says we have certain rights. We have the right to due process, we have the right to freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and also in the context of criminal law, you have the right to be free from search and seizure. And so there's a variety of these particular laws and they're seen as just being having kind of supreme, excuse me, supreme authority in Canada. Do you think, Catherine, do you have anything to add? I'll pull you in here. <laughs> oh gee, thanks, Emily. No. <laughs> No, I don't. There's a couple other questions in there. And then I thought, too, if you just wanted to maybe even talk about some of the things that you hit in foundations, you know, some of the really basic questions, like what's the difference between pub public and private law? Like, you know, there's just, a, I think, a few things here that we're assuming that people know, or what the heck is a tort? I remember when I was in 1L realizing it's not just cake, you know, there's, there's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I tried to get a lot of these things it. later on introductory definition but i think it's a lot to consume quickly i mean honestly to everyone listening i've covered different areas of law today where you will do an entire day with us on this in foundations we cover each of those topics like tort law is 
a private wrong, which means not much, does it? It just means I decide to sue someone else privately. That, that, that's all it really means because I think that they have harmed me in some way. Um, and so, so in foundations, we, I, I love foundations. I was part of designing the course with Alice Woolley, who is now on the bench and, and Jen has come in and kind of given it new life as well. And, um, we really try to introduce you to concepts of law. Like what are all the different areas of law? How do they fit together? And the pragmatic things like, okay, you need to understand the legal system. You need to look at the case I mentioned and understand, is this binding on me or not? How does this work? Um, and as part of that, we start putting you to work. You know, we, we cover each of the areas of law you learn as a first year, as well as indigenous, you know, indigenous law is its own legal system and how that filters through all the areas of the law. And then we work with you on how do you read and brief cases? How do you analyze a problem? If a client comes to you and they're like, this just happened to me, how do you take the case law and put it together and give advice and explain what the law is and we all start you working on oral advocacy not like you're in court you do that in foundations too but law is about advocacy and being clear communicators and we have you do that in in foundations one great um so we have a question if you wouldn't mind repeating the name of the scholar that you mentioned at the beginning the one yeah has done the work on robots <laughs> oh, hold on I have it right here. Can I? So it's Ari Waldman and his work is amazing. And it's, uh, he wrote a book called Privacy as Trust. It's so readable and it's wonderful. And I assign um, parts of it to my students in my privacy and cybersecurity class. And I was also supposed to be at his conference in New York. And then um, we have a small workshop we do and, and it got canceled at the last minute because it was, it was in mid-March, so I'm kind of glad I didn't go. <laughs> That's yeah. too bad. Yeah. Um, do you have any recommended readings to look into before a student starts the foundation course? No. Um, <laughs> and you know, and it's partly because there isn't really um, a magic bullet. I know that there are, you know, we, we walk you through that. I think that those books were really important to prepare you when you were just thrown into all your first year courses, but we actually set you up to be ready for those courses with foundations one. So we do that role for you. So, and, and first year is busy and it's hard and it's amazing in so many ways. Um, so get your rest, do other things, you know, enjoy, your, enjoy your family. Um, we will provide you the initial reading uh, ahead of time for like some of the stuff for Foundations One, uh, so that you you know can get going in a, on, on a few of those things. Um, Catherine, I don't know. Do you know some of the texts? Yeah, you know we get asked this question every single year, um, and I and I get it. I think it's a really good question, so I don't mean in anything by by that. But you're quite right, Emily. Um, you know. Um, the three week intensive that we do on foundations is just excellent. Um, no other school does anything like it. There's some that are starting to, but nobody's doing a three week intensive at the beginning of both September and January in terms of giving you those building blocks to really be able to understand your substantive courses in depth. But one thing um, that I know that Alice Woolley Justice Woolley used to often say when she um, was the chair of the admissions committee um, and would do some, you know, introductory work with me was to be well read, um, you know, on, on what's going on in the world. And goodness knows there's enough going on in the world right now that um, you could be pretty busy. Um, and to read about things from different points of view, because we're living in quite an echo chamber. Um, you know, I, I have to... Um, say that Twitter's a bit of a rabbit hole for me that I'm really trying to wean myself off of, both from my blood pressure perspective and, and other things. But I also tend to follow people that I generally, you know, would agree with or, or, or want to learn from and not so much people that I, I, I wouldn't 
want to. So I think it's not just important to learn about things from the perspective that makes you feel comfortable, but also maybe try to um, you know, reach out to different types of um, points of view. Now I'm not talking about like radical um, points of view so much as just people who might not have your everyday viewpoint on things. Because guess what, when you come to law school and I can tell you, there's people from all sorts of different backgrounds, um, perspectives, um, interests, um, you know, things that are important to them and learning to respectfully disagree with people and advocate and learn from different sides is all part of being a law student. It's what it makes law, law school so interesting, I think, is the gray areas and, and really learning that, man, you, you know, somebody might be able to change your mind. You just have to be open to that. Um, and That's I good advice. Yeah, we're just getting so tunnel visioned, right? Um, that it's getting harder for us to open up to those possibilities. And I think it's a challenging thing to do, but I've literally been trying to do that more in my own life because I've, I'm, yeah, as I say, just getting a little more and more um, set in my ways as I go on. And uh, as somebody who lets a lot of different people from lots of different perspectives into law school, I think everybody deserves that respect. And so, in as much as you can really try to inform yourselves about the world, because the law is not something that, you know, you're learning in a, a vacuum or a, a box. As Emily has, I think, very well pointed out, this is, this is cutting edge things. These are areas of, you know, law, things that we're thinking about that didn't exist when I went to law school. Um, I'm so old that the charter had just come in. <laughs> it was a really great time to be in law school because we suddenly had a charter. <laughs> it was a fascinating time to be in law school, but that's how long it was. And the kinds of areas that you're going to be learning about. And one of the um, sessions we're going to do later is on fintech. So financial technology is that Ryan Clements is going to talk about. Well, that was not something anybody talked about, right? There's lots of different things. So Instead of a book on how to do law school, I would just really ask you to stay open to, you know, different perspectives and to learn about different perspectives. And, um, and the world, as complicated as it is that we're living in right now, and I think that will really help you um, to be able to imbibe the um, information and, uh, that, you know, you're going to learn and to be prepared to speak knowledgeably and respectfully disagree with other people because you will. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives in a classroom. As I say, I think that's what makes law school so exciting, honestly, and we don't have opportunities these days for that. Especially it actually that prepares part. you for foundations because I mean, so one of the things I don't mention is we also get into, you know, how do you critically analyze the law, which is a really yeah. important skill uh, to be able to figure out how do I finagle this, like for my client or to understand it better, understand its weaknesses and um, having, and we really push you to think about these different perspectives and how, and we have conversations about it like every day. It seems to be, okay, well, let's think about this case this other way. Well, what are the issues that they're missing here? Um, and how and then you know sometimes you, you will read one level you know court of appeal judgment we like well how why did the supreme court of canada see this differently what was it about it and so being well read helps you just with the mindset yeah that's great advice makes me miss alice so there <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we can still go dog walking with her <laughs> um, there's so a there, yeah, so we have a couple more questions, and then I think we'll wrap up because we told people this is only half an hour. But um, sorry, guys, so, I went over a bit. Man, it's I all good. It an hour. Sorry. Um, so uh, someone has a question: If you have any thoughts on the issues that are arising about online sex work and the invasions of privacy that they are experiencing, and the lack of legal protection that they might face. Oh, that's interesting. And I, you know, I, I was talking with other. Um, uh, someone else who does a lot of work in, in uh, human trafficking too about that uh, particular issue. It, it's not the area that I have done a lot of work in. I have to confess has been uh, about specifically online sex work. Um, I do know that it is um, an issue that's uh, mainly criminal law issues where they're looking at this particular one. 
And that the biggest challenge here often is, is because of the tech aspects is actually being able to track people. So um, I don't know, have any of you ever been on the dark web? So I, you know, what's really strange. So if you take my internet law class, I don't know if I'll be able to do it because the person who did it's moved away, but Hey, we have, we now have zoom, right? <laughs> and, um, he would actually take us to the dark web and we'd start looking at, I mean, it's essentially like eBay, but for criminals and they sell people on these particular sites. We don't look at those particular boards. We looked more at um, like selling Uzis or something, but there are really active, terrifying networks of, of human trafficking and it's, and it's takes, so the problem in the law is it takes coordinated effort between different countries, which can be problematic to try to be able to actually track down people. So the expense and time involved in it makes this a huge issue. Great. So the last question we have, um, are there any notable amendments or appendages coming to hate speech laws in Canada? Uh, the debate around what constitutes hate speech seems to be controversial and mired in subjectivity. Yeah, and you know, I don't know if it'll change, but we actually have been doing hate speech as a particular topic in foundations. Um, but, you know, one of the issues is the cases are so complicated that it's really hard to introduce it to you one week into law school. Um, I, there, as far as I know, there are absolutely no intentions to amend the hate speech laws at the moment. Most of the focus has always been do we need to reintroduce uh, non-criminal hate speech laws? So um, our hate speech laws are actually broader than the American version. So the American version of hate speech laws is so narrow that essentially you cannot successfully uh, prosecute someone except for the most narrow of circumstances. <laughs> But in Canada, it's a more, uh, it's an objective assessment and it's more broadly about like things like willful promotion of hatred to a group, which is a broader notion. Um, so that's really enabled the police to be able to prosecute specific interest, instances of hate speech. It is a crime though, and because it's speech, you have to be careful and you want the crime to be to an extent narrowly confined so that we know what the wrong is. Um, if you look at the, in other contexts, should you be able to uh, bring an action to a human rights commission for hate speech so that it's not quite as narrow as a criminal action? Maybe. Um, it's, the provision was repealed federally and, um, and it's such a, I'll, I know we have to end, so let me just say this really quickly. It, it, it was partly because you have to look in, uh, and know that free speech is implicated when it comes to hate speech and that there can be a line between what's very obviously hate speech and then other scenarios, which is basically um, sometimes the views of minorities. So often minority viewpoints are categorized as hate speech when they're not um, just because of the prevailing views of majority. So it can backfire. Uh, but get this, the internet because it crosses provincial borders, generally is federal jurisdiction. So that means provincially, you also can't go to a human rights commission about hate speech. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of a gap in the law here. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. And that's important to learn about too, is, you know, it, everything isn't covered and, and there are these gaps, not just in this type of law, but in many different kinds of law and, It'll, it'll be interesting. The law is always changing and always interesting, even if it can be very frustrating sometimes when it's, you know, behind where you'd like it to be. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Emily for preparing this mini lecture for you. I found it very interesting. I hope you did too, and I'm sure you did. And to Allie for all her help. Allie,